It's 9 p.m. on a Saturday night and I find myself sitting alone in my favorite bar. I've been here solo for about half an hour, slowly sipping on my first beer. Meanwhile, my FWB is out, spending her evening pursuing intimacy with another man, and has assured me she'll return to share the details once she's done. Not exactly an ideal situation, is it? What makes it even more perplexing is that it was her suggestion, and I supported her choice. I'm not someone who enjoys being cuckolded, quite the opposite, actually. But when thoughts of revenge consume your mind, you sometimes find yourself agreeing to things you'd normally find unacceptable. This is one of those instances. My name's Ken Singleton, and I'd say I'm your typical guy next door. I grew up in a cozy rural town not far from Omaha, close enough to enjoy the city perks yet far enough for a simple life. My folks had a typical middle American marriage, loving and supportive, raising my younger brother and me with solid values. They were always there for our school events, instilling in us the importance of integrity and pursuing our goals without trampling on others. While I didn't always agree with my parents, by the time I went off to college in Lincoln, I realized I wanted a relationship like theirs. So, I wasn't out chasing casual flings among the thousands of co-eds at the University of Nebraska. I was on the lookout for a future wife willing to take my time to find the right match. That's when I met Naomi Simpson, a lovely brunette studying nursing in Lincoln. Compared to me, she seemed out of my league. To my eyes, she was stunning, just a tad shorter than my 5'10 frame, with captivating green eyes and dimples when she smiled. Sure, she had a bit of extra weight, but it only enhanced her figure, giving her soft curves in all the right places. We shared a freshman language class together and the professor was quite meticulous about seating arrangements, so we ended up sitting in alphabetical order right from the start. This meant Simpson sat to the left of Singleton. The memory of our first interaction when she took the seat next to mine is still vivid in my mind. I developed strong feelings for her, so when I invited her to join me for a soda at the union after class, I was overjoyed when she accepted. That marked the beginning of a relationship that lasted throughout our college years. Although we decided to postpone our wedding until after graduation, we functioned as a couple throughout, even moving in together at the beginning of our junior year. We eventually tied the knot in her family's large church in Lincoln, which was conveniently close to my hometown, allowing many of my family and friends to attend. After our honeymoon, we settled in Omaha, where she began working as an ER nurse while I secured a job as a civic engineer at a local firm. Initially, Naomi worked the night shift as a new employee, meaning I spent several nights alone in bed each week. However, the time we spent together when we were both home more than made up for it. It seemed as though I had found the ideal partner, just as I had always hoped. Due to our conflicting work schedules, we decided to postpone starting a family for the time being, enabling us to save money for when one of us eventually chose to stay home with the children. Naomi grew to appreciate working the night shift, as it spared her from the politics she often encountered during the day shift when specialty services and administrators were present. Despite being presented with multiple opportunities to switch to days, we discussed each one and ultimately decided it was best for her to remain on the night shift. After a decade of being married to Naomi, I began to realize that our marriage might not be as perfect as I once thought. I was eager to start a family, thinking about wanting to be young enough to enjoy family activities when our children reached high school. Doing some calculations made me realize that if we waited much longer, we might not become grandparents until our late 50s or 60s. However, Naomi disagreed, citing her dedication to her nursing career and her reluctance to give it up to raise a family. Whenever I tried to discuss it, she would shut me down immediately. Around the same time, I started noticing other changes. On evenings when Naomi had to work, we used to have about 30 minutes to spend together, which was usually enough for intimacy to hold us over until her days off. But now, that time had dwindled to the point where she didn't want any distractions while getting ready for work, and our intimate moments together were reduced to a quick kiss on the cheek as she left. Despite still deeply loving her and wanting to spend my life with her, I was unhappy with the way things were going. So, I waited for a couple of days off we both had and planned a two-night stay at a bed and breakfast, just across the border in Iowa, hoping to revive what we had lost. 
When she came home from work that morning, I surprised her with the plan, hoping she would see my efforts to prioritize our relationship and give us some much-needed time away from the stresses of work to focus on each other. It turned out that it wasn't suitable for her at all. While she didn't express anger towards me, I sensed her reluctance. She guided me to our living room and instructed me to sit down. A knot formed in the pit of my stomach, signaling that my marriage was facing serious challenges for the first time. Ken, this is going to be tough, she said. I hate that we have to have this conversation, but it's necessary. She swallowed and averted her gaze as she continued. I don't think I'm in love with you anymore. I still care about you, and a part of me always will. But I've come to realize that maintaining romantic love for you is no longer feasible. She paused, allowing her words to sink in. My initial reaction was profound sadness, knowing she was the one I wanted to spend my life with. Yet her revelation made it clear she didn't share the same sentiment. Anger started to rise within me, but I understood that arguing wouldn't help, so as calmly as possible I knew I needed to understand why. I inquired, Naomi, how long have you been feeling this way? I've sensed a shift in our relationship from when we first got married. What brought about this change? Naomi sighed, turning to face me. I'm not entirely certain anything has changed, Ken. I'm just not sure if I've ever felt the same level of love for you as you do for me. I know it sounds terrible, and the last thing I want is to cause you pain. Looking back, I realize you've always been, and still are, an amazing man overflowing with love. I guess I assumed I would eventually reciprocate that love. Now, I'm not so sure that's possible. Realizing my marriage might have been built on falsehood since the beginning, I struggled to contain my anger, my hands trembling as I sat on the couch. Fueled by rising fury, my next questions came out sharply. So you've found someone else and decided you can love him more than me? Avoiding my gaze, Naomi confirmed. Yes, Ken. There's someone I've been talking to, and it seems we share more compatible life philosophies than you and I do. What on earth? How much time do you need with someone to align on life philosophies? I pondered Naomi's late shifts at the hospital, immediately wondering if this newfound compatibility meant she'd found an ER doctor available during her hours. My subsequent inquiry dripped with sheer fury. So you're implying that you've found some young, attractive doctor, and you're being unfaithful to me. She swiftly turned to respond. That's not the case, Ken. Actually, he's not a doctor at all nor does he work at the hospital. He's our tax accountant. In fact, you instructed me to find him, though initially I didn't anticipate falling in love with him. You delegated the tax responsibilities to me since I had weekdays off, sparing you from missing work. At first it was strictly business for several years, but gradually we got to know each other on a personal level, and there was a connection between us. It evolved to the point where we'd have lunch together, Again, solely for business purposes and only during tax season. However, I eventually realized that my feelings for him surpassed professionalism, and it turned out he felt the same way. Our lunches continued even after tax season, and I grew incredibly comfortable around him, feeling like I could confide in him about anything. At this juncture, tears welled up in both our eyes, indicating that her decision had been brewing for quite some time, which only deepened my sadness. With the last remnants of anger bubbling within me, I unleashed one final pointed question. Does he satisfy you more than I do? She cried and shook her heed. Ken, please. I haven't been intimate with him yet. This isn't about physical intimacy at all. Believe it or not, I still care for you enough that I didn't want to cause you pain by being with him while we were still in a relationship. Seeing how much I'm hurting you is already difficult. Adding that would have been even more cruel. I was so consumed by anger at this point that I couldn't fully process her words about pain. I didn't know whether to trust her or not. The agony I was experiencing was unlike anything I had felt before. But I knew I had to take action. Would it be worth it to plead with her to reconsider? I wasn't sure, but I had to make an attempt. I stood up and approached her, looking directly into her eyes, and asked, Could there be a chance that you're mistaken about this? and that it's just a fleeting attraction that will fade away. 
I'm not happy that you've become close to another guy, but if you haven't been intimate with him yet, I'm willing to fight for you and try to salvage what I believed we had together. She moved closer to me, placing a hand on my arm and resting her head against my shoulder. I'm sorry, Ken. As much as I dreaded telling you this, now that I have, there's no turning back. Please don't hate me, although I understand if you do. I walked away from her and entered our bedroom. I picked up our two suitcases and began packing them. Part of me expected her to follow me in, but she opted to let me handle it alone. After filling the suitcases and a bag with my toiletries, I started carrying them to my car. I knew I'd have to return later to collect the rest of my belongings, but for now, what I had would suffice until I had more permanent plans in place. Naomi remained standing there as I made my way to the door. She was still crying, which struck me as melodramatic considering she was getting what she wanted. A part of me wondered if her tears were because she still harbored some love for me, enough to feel pain knowing I was hurting after being blindsided. Pausing at the door, I turned back to her. Are you going to initiate the divorce proceedings, or should I? Through tear-filled eyes, she replied, No, I'll handle it. It's the least I can do. Ken, I promise not to make this any more painful than it already is. Please let me know your new address so I can have the papers sent there. I don't want to embarrass you at work in front of your colleagues. I nodded resignedly as I left my home for the final time as its inhabitant. I was traversing the familiar stages one does in such circumstances, questioning my worth, my performance in bed, my attentiveness, my expectations for children, and how long her love had faded. Why hadn't I seen it coming? The legal process proceeded smoothly. Papers were served shortly after I settled into my new apartment. The divorce, as far as divorces go, was amicable. Some friends suggested I fight for more, given she was the one causing the damage, but Nebraska's no-fault policy and my own maturity made me realize it was futile. After being served, there was a 60-day wait, then another 30 days before the divorce finalized. Neither of us could remarry for six months, but that was inconsequential to me. Marriage was the last thing on my mind. Instead, I cocooned myself in my apartment, nursing the wounds of the divorce. Thankfully, my family and friends rallied around me, urging me to move forward. They were right. I needed to shake off the self-pity that had engulfed me since the end of my marriage. I stumbled upon a trendy sports bar nearby and gradually found solace in watching games with companions. Before long, I was a regular, relishing the camaraderie. I encountered the next significant woman in my life there, although I wasn't seeking to date again at the time. Shannon changed that completely. As one of the regular bartenders, it was evident that she was adored by all the patrons, even by the wives and girlfriends of some customers. Her constant smile was infectious. Being around her at the bar marked the first time since my breakup that I found myself smiling and laughing. One quiet Wednesday evening, she approached me. All right, Ken. You've been a regular here for a while now. What's your story? What made you suddenly become one of our most loyal patrons? Having shared my story with family and friends, recounting it to her was no issue. She listened attentively as I detailed what had transpired, interjecting with questions from time to time. It was evident she had a compassionate ear, genuinely concerned as I described the pain I experienced upon learning. My marriage was ending. When I finished, she patted my hand and said, I'm sorry, Ken. It's a shame she didn't spare you years of believing your life was perfect by telling you sooner. It may seem hard to believe, but the pain will ease. It has in my life, so I'm confident it will for you too. Her words seemed somewhat harsh, and she noticed my surprise, prompting her to share her own story. Like me, she met her husband in college, but he was a senior when she was a freshman. He pursued a business career in Kansas City, urging her to drop out of school to marry him, which she did. For a while, they seemed happy, but when he admitted to having an affair with his assistant, who was pregnant with his child, she left immediately. She fared well in the divorce, even receiving some alimony. She was bartending now since she had dropped out of college and lacked marketable skills. I could detect the remnants of anguish in her gaze as she confided in me. Yet her divorce had occurred two years prior to mine. 
so she seemed to have largely moved on. Presently, she found contentment in bartending and relishing the company of patrons who valued her amiable nature. It was evident why they were drawn to her. She exuded beauty alongside a lively personality. However, it was her genuine smiles and the extra care she extended to her customers that truly distinguished her. Despite having sworn off relationships with women for the time being, I couldn't deny her effect on me. In the ensuing weeks, the pain began to recede somewhat, with Shannon playing a significant role in that process. Perhaps it was my imagination, but it seemed to me that on the night she worked, she paid slightly more attention to me than to other customers. She didn't neglect them, but whenever she had a spare moment, she would come down to my end of the bar and engage in conversation. I felt somewhat akin to Norm from Cheers. I had my designated spot at the bar, and she made an effort to keep it reserved for me before my arrival. Roughly a year after my divorce was finalized, two remarkable events unfolded. The first was the deepening of my connection with Shannon. I had resolved to re-enter the dating scene as a New Year's resolution, and one Friday evening I boldly broached the subject with Shannon, asking if she was open to having a boyfriend. She gave a knowing smile and replied, Let me finish serving these drinks, and then we'll talk. Her response didn't bolster my confidence, so when she returned I was apprehensive about my prospects. Drawing closer to ensure I could hear over the din of the bar, she said, I'll be honest with you, Ken. I really like you, but I'm not actively seeking a relationship. My last one was so draining that I'm not sure I'll be ready anytime soon. I gazed at her while inquiring. So, does that mean you're not planning on indulging in any, let's say, grown-up enjoyment in your life? She smirked. You're adorable sometimes. I do have my share of grown-up fun. I have a couple of friends with benefits for that purpose, as you put it. It's strictly physical. We try to avoid any emotional entanglements to keep things simple. I'm not sure if you're the type who'd be interested in that sort of arrangement, and I'm not seeking anything emotionally involved at the moment. Then she flashed a smile and placed her hand over mine. But if you're curious about learning more about an FWB setup, I know just the person who could enlighten you. With that, she went off to attend to other customers. For the first time in a while, I viewed her as a desirable woman first, rather than just a potential life partner. She had a point. I had never considered an FWB situation in my life, assuming it unnecessary once I met Naomi. But I pondered the harm in it, especially since I wasn't having any sexual encounters other than solo ones, and Shannon had just hinted that I could. Realizing there was no apparent harm, I resolved to find out if Shannon was simply being kind or genuinely interested in showing me the ropes of being friends with benefits. Typically, I leave before the bar shuts down. However, being that it was a Friday and I didn't have work the next day, I opted to stay until closing time for a private conversation. I noticed her glancing over at me a few times, likely wondering why I was still there past my usual departure. About 15 minutes before closing, our eyes met again and a broad smile spread across her face. She approached me directly and asked, Are you sticking around because you're curious about what an FWB arrangement entails? I gave a sheepish grin and replied softly, Maybe. She chuckled and went to attend to a couple of customers at the other end of the bar. When she returned, only a few patrons remained out of earshot. She circled around the bar and took a seat beside me. Here's the deal. We can go to your place or mine, it doesn't matter to me. We have sex and then we either spend the night together or not, it's up in the air. We're not exclusive, meaning we're both free to see other people. But we don't share details about those encounters. The only strict rule I have is that we don't develop feelings for each other. I'm willing to give this a shot with you because I sense it's been a while for you, and I have a hunch you'll be quite good once you let go of any pent-up emotions. However, since this might be new territory for you, we'll need to discuss afterward to see if you can abide by the rules. Mull it over while I wrap things up with these last customers and let me know if you're on board. It didn't take me long to process. By the time she returned after locking the door, I was fully committed. I nodded affirmatively and she approached, embracing me tightly, followed by a kiss. As soon as our tongues intertwined, I became fully aroused. After we paused, she looked up at me and remarked, 
That was a test and you passed with flying colors. Where should we go? My apartment is just a block away, clean with a spacious bed for both of us. If you stay over, I'll take you back to your car in the morning. Shannon didn't say a word. She took my hand and led me to the door. Making sure it was locked as we left, she turned to me and it was my turn to lead. We hurried to my apartment. Initially, I thought I might be a bit nervous since it had been over a year since I'd been in this situation. However, our second kiss inside my apartment helped ease my apprehensions. By the time we reached my bedroom, clothes were scattered on the floor, and I couldn't help but grin as both I and my erection eagerly anticipated the sight of this stunning woman standing naked before me. We made love twice that night before drifting off to sleep, and she woke me up with a blowjob at ten in the next morning. She was insatiable in bed, and as I cooked her breakfast while she showered, I couldn't help but think how foolish her husband must have been to betray her. But I didn't dwell on it because his loss was my gain. We conversed over breakfast. She inquired, so how was your first experience with a friend with benefits? Do you see yourself wanting to continue this? I chuckled and remarked, yeah, it was all right, enjoyable enough that I wouldn't mind doing it again. It's reassuring to see I haven't forgotten anything. In jest, she punched my arm and countered, All right? It was fantastic. Probably thanks to my incredible skills. But let's be honest now. I know you've only had sex with emotional attachment since your freshman year of college. Can you fully embrace the idea of casual sex without seeking a deeper connection with me? I couldn't give a definite answer since I hadn't pondered it much. So I replied, Let's just say, when can we do it again? Sex is always better when shared. In the following weeks, I realized I could engage in sex without a relationship, or at least I convinced myself of that. Shannon was amazing, and what made me question my stance on casual sex was that I enjoyed spending time with her at the bar, almost as much as being intimate with her, which hinted at a deeper connection. Yet I wasn't ready to give up the physical aspect because it was consistently as satisfying, if not more so, as the first time. Then came the second surprising event. One evening at the bar, someone placed a hand on my shoulder. I turned to see a woman whose face seemed familiar, but I couldn't immediately recall where I'd seen her. She grinned and said, Aren't you Ken? Ken Singleton? I replied, Yes, and you look familiar, but I'm sorry, I don't know your name. She rested her hand on my arm and said, I'm Anita Peterson. I work as a nurse in the ER with your wife. Well, ex-wife now. We've met a couple of times at unit Christmas parties. I recalled those gatherings. She always seemed particularly friendly toward me, perhaps even more so than usual, but I didn't dwell on it. I simply viewed her as someone who was naturally outgoing. She continued, expressing her sympathy for my separation and divorce. She had hoped it wouldn't happen, considering how well we seemed to mesh as a couple. However, she mentioned a notion she had read about in the past, that couples in open marriages had a higher divorce rate than monogamous ones. She seemed to imply that our situation fell into that statistic. Open marriage? Where did she get that idea from? I didn't want to reveal my ignorance, but I was curious. I carefully replied, Well, I suppose that's a risk you take. It was good while it lasted. Did she ever discuss our relationship with you? Anita's expression lit up as she responded. She spoke about it quite often. I couldn't understand how she allowed you to have women over while she was at work. But when you mentioned the possibility of her enjoying the company of a doctor or technician during her break, it made sense. Whenever I saw her slipping into the on-call room with the night shift doctor, I couldn't help but think of you, wondering if you had someone with you in bed that night. That deceitful, unfaithful woman. She had been having affairs behind my back, perhaps multiple affairs, and I had been completely unaware. Any remaining love for her vanished instantly. I berated myself for granting her an amicable divorce, unaware of her infidelity at the time. Now I suspected she was involved with the man she eventually left me for, yet the intense hatred I felt toward her remained unchanged. I made an effort not to reveal my intentions to Anita, but I quickly recognized an opportunity for some potential payback. So, when you were curious about me, I asked, 
Were you wondering if I wanted you to spend the night with me? She blushed and responded softly. Maybe. She always talked about how great you were. And I could see it too, especially since you agreed she could have some fun while she was away from you. I wouldn't have minded having a bit of that fun myself. This was a new development, but my first priority was ensuring that if she was involved with someone else, I wouldn't pursue anything with her. So I inquired, what about you, Anita? Are you married or in a relationship? She nodded and said no, still searching for the right one. That was reassuring. Anita was an attractive blonde, something I hadn't experienced before. Perhaps she could be my first. I grinned at her and suggested, well, Anita, no pressure, but I'm also not committed right now. If you're still interested, maybe we could head back to my place and see if being in my bed is as appealing as you imagined. Her smile widened into a grin as she replied, Oh, that sounds lovely. I came here with some friends, but I'm sure they won't mind if you take me home. As we left, I noticed Shannon watching us from the bar. I couldn't quite decipher her expression, but it seemed different from Ushuel. Could she possibly be Jilus of Anita? We weren't supposed to have any emotional attachment, and she had been clear that we weren't exclusive. While accompanying Anita to her house, I clarified to her that I wasn't seeking a committed relationship, but if we both enjoyed each other's company, I was open to maintaining a friends with benefits set up. Until two months ago, the concept of friends with benefits hadn't crossed my mind, but now I found myself with two such friends, which made life enjoyable. Anita turned out to be quite enjoyable, and despite her being blonde, which didn't necessarily impact our intimacy, I found pleasure in observing her hair bounce as I engaged in intimacy with her from behind. Leaving her place around midnight with the bar still open until Wangao, I decided to swing by and check on Shannon, maybe relish a bit in my own satisfaction. However, when I entered, she didn't greet me as usual. Taking my usual spot for the first half hour, all she did was bring me my usual beer. Finally, around 12.30, she approached and sat next to me. Did you have a good time? I shook my head. No, remember, we agreed not to discuss other relationships if this is going to work. She nodded in agreement, though I could sense it bothered her. Admittedly, I had no knowledge of her other connections, but if I saw her leaving with someone else, I might have strong feelings too. Changing the subject, I said, Anita did mention something unexpected that stirred up a lot of anger in me. Without realizing it, she revealed that my wife was having an affair with at least one ER doctor while we were married. Shannon's eyes widened as I recounted what Anita had disclosed, particularly the part about Naomi deceiving the staff to cover up her inappropriate behavior with the doctors. By the time I finished, my anger had resurfaced. What do you plan to do about it? She asked. Are you just going to let it slide? I turned towards her and stated, Had I known about this prior to the divorce, I wouldn't have been as kind as I was to her. It's too late to erupt with divorce demands, and it probably wouldn't have made a difference anyway. But I do desire some form of retaliation. I want her to experience the same pain I felt when she confessed she wanted a divorce. Actually, I want her to feel the agony I'm feeling now, knowing she was unfaithful. We sat quietly for a moment. Shannon reached out and placed her hand on mine, asking, So you want her to understand the pain of betrayal? After pondering for a moment, I replied, Yes, that's precisely what I want. She squeezed my hand and proposed, I have a rather unconventional plan, but we'll need to collaborate on it. If successful... It could be one of the greatest acts of revenge ever. We'll become legendary. Are you interested? If Shannon was bothered by my previous date with Anita, she seemed to have moved past it. Absolutely, count me in. What's your plan? With a sly grin, she responded, If we want her to experience the pain of her partner cheating on her, we'll have to make it happen. Now you have to understand that my friends with benefits are typically unattached guys. I don't usually make exceptions to that rule, but I can only think of one way to ensure he cheats on her. I need to seduce him. I was incredulous at what I had just heard. While I understood Naomi's potential reaction to her partner's infidelity, 
I couldn't fathom Shannon doing the same for me. I expressed this disbelief to her explicitly. In response, she insisted, You're not asking me to do this. I want to do this. Remember, I've felt the same pain you have, and I want the person who hurt you to experience the same. Since you can't take legal action against her in the divorce anymore, this seems like the next logical step. But why would you do this for me? I queried. Why would you engage in intimacy with a stranger just to help me get back at my ex? She sighed and replied, Honestly, Ken Singleton, I have a soft spot for you. I want to help you make this happen. I'll treat him as a one-time FWB, emphasis on one time. If I can convince him, I'll arrange for it to happen at my place, and I'll discreetly record it. Afterward, we'll send her a copy of the video and our mission will be accomplished. It was a stroke of genius, surpassing anything I could have devised alone. I couldn't believe she was willing to go to such lengths for me. Despite our supposed lack of romantic involvement, I couldn't help but wonder. If we succeeded, she would be my hero. Forever. Before I could respond, she delved back into planning mode. I need to know who this guy is. Didn't you mention he was the accountant who handled your taxes? If so, you should have his name from previous tax forms he prepared. I never considered looking there before, and honestly, I never had much interest in knowing who he was. Even though he essentially took her away from me, I never felt any desire for revenge against him. But everything changed with the revelation of Naomi's cheating. I made a mental note to locate the tax records she had duplicated for me as part of the divorce settlement. Shannon was still strategizing. If your ex is still working nights, it should be easy to find a night she's scheduled to work and plan our rendezvous then. Can you get that information for me? I felt a bit embarrassed as I responded. I'm sure I could. My friend tonight works with Naomi. I suppose she'd assist me. It would give her another excuse to see me again. I wasn't sure what Shannon muttered under her breath, but I thought I caught the word tart. It amused me. Perhaps Shannon was deviating from her own rules for a friends with benefits arrangement. The rest of her plan was as clever as its inception. If he made advances on your wife while preparing your taxes, there's no reason to think he wouldn't do it again. I don't know how forward your wife was with him before they got together, but I have a feeling I can be more persuasive than she was, and I have a couple of perfect outfits to prove it. This year, I think Mr. Wife Steeler needs to prepare my taxes. And there it was. The plan was complete. She aimed to execute it within six weeks. Once I received Shannon's schedule from Anita, we'd confirm the date. But until then, it was Shannon's turn to make an appointment to have her taxes done, once I provided her with a name. The trap was set and my alluring friend Shannon was ready to be the bait. Everything fell into place smoothly. Shannon was right about finding the name of my ex's account and boyfriend on our tax forms. Jerry Van Doren was easy to locate since Naomi had copied his business card which was stapled to the original forms. Shannon scheduled her initial visit. She texted me two pictures of her outfit. One revealed a loose-fitting blouse paired with skin-tight jeans while the second showed her bending over, braless, with her blouse gaping open at the top. The guy didn't stand a chance. The next time I met up with Anita, she provided me with Naomi's work schedule. Although it wasn't finalized for six weeks ahead, Anita assured me that Naomi followed a repeating two-week schedule, making it easy to anticipate her Friday night shifts. With this knowledge, Shannon initiated her plan to charm Jerry, her new accountant. She excitedly recounted her success after their first meeting, noting Jerry's difficulty in tearing his gaze away from her. The plan proceeded smoothly. Anita confirmed that the chosen Friday for the finale coincided with Naomi's work shift. Shannon continued to persuade Jerry despite him having completed her taxes the week before. She convinced him to deepen their relationship by inviting him over for dinner and a movie on the chosen Friday, to which he eagerly agreed. That Friday night has arrived. You're up to speed on the story so far. After Jerry leaves Shannon's apartment, she had promised to meet me at the bar and update me on the outcome. I was conflicted. On one hand, I was pleased that our plan had gone smoothly, and it seemed like we were on track to exact revenge on Naomi. However, it also meant that Shannon was with another man, and despite warnings not to develop feelings for her, 
Our time together planning and executing our scheme had made me realize how special she was. What she was doing for me was significant too, leading me to wonder if she had developed feelings for me in return. Around 11.30 she arrived walking slowly and appearing unhappy. I couldn't discern from her demeanor whether she had succeeded, which worried me. She didn't seem like someone who had just achieved a six-week-long goal. Sitting beside me she was brought a beer by the bartender. I watched as she drank almost half of it quickly before putting it down. Her expression was deadly serious when she looked at me. I was desperate for her answer, growing more anxious the longer she hesitated. Finally, she spoke. It's done. I slept with that disgusting bastard. And the video clearly shows his face throughout. There's no doubt your ex's boyfriend is now a cheater. I yearned to embrace her, to kiss her, to hold her tight, and to express countless other feelings. However, given her current mood... I doubted she would welcome such gestures. So, I turned to her and expressed my gratitude simply. Thank you. You have no idea how much this means to me. Once we provide her with the evidence, the ordeal will be over, and we can move past this. If there's ever anything I can do for you, I certainly owe you that much. I gently placed my hand on her leg and let it rest there. We sat in silence for a few moments while she finished her beer. Setting the mug down, she turned to me. There is something you can do right now. I know you're not into that cuckold stuff and I wouldn't do that to you, but I need you to take me to your apartment and make love to me. You owe me that. I can't fathom what your ex sees in him. He's repulsive. The last person inside me was that jerk and I need you to erase that memory. And it better take all night. You're not getting sloppy seconds. I made sure he wore a condom. My body craves you, Ken. It craves you right now. Who was I to argue? I settled our bill and then we walked hand in hand to my apartment. I couldn't say if it truly took all night to reclaim her, but we dedicated ourselves to the task for hours. Strangely, it didn't bother me that she had been with someone else just an hour prior. All I knew was that she had given me more than I could have hoped for. And if it meant spending the rest of my life showing her my gratitude, then that's what I would do. We anonymously sent Naomi the complete unedited footage of Shannon's encounter with Jerry Van Doren. Although it clearly depicted Jerry's face, Shannon wasn't overly concerned about her own face being visible. Neither of us anticipated Naomi posting the video on a pornographic website or any social media platform, as it didn't align with her typical behavior. However, it turned out that being an unfaithful partner wasn't out of character for her, a realization I had underestimated. As expected, Naomi reached out to me about a week after receiving the DVD, asking to meet and talk. We agreed to meet at a nearby coffee shop following her morning shift at the hospital. Upon her arrival, it was evident that she wasn't feeling well, likely due to the exhaustion from her lengthy 12-hour shift, although I suspected there was more to her demeanor. After grabbing her coffee, Naomi joined me at a secluded table, wasting no time in broaching the conversation I had anticipated. I wanted to let you know that I discovered the man I left you for has been unfaithful to me. We've ended things. I suppose he didn't love me as much as I believed I loved him. This revelation brought a sense of vindication. Well, Naomi, I can certainly relate to that. Your situation sounds all too familiar to me. And it's a terrible feeling to realize your partner has been deceitful, leading you to believe in a falsehood. Her expression darkened it as she grasped the meaning of my words. I suppose I brought this oop on myself. I understand if you don't believe me. But I genuinely loved you, Ken. I still do. Because you were an exceptional husband and my own self-centered behavior blinded me to that fact. Despite your kindness, I foolishly believed I could find something better. Clearly, that was a grave mistake. I relished every moment of this. To hear her acknowledge her wrongdoing after the pain she caused me was pure satisfaction. Yet she hadn't confessed to her workplace affairs during our marriage. I needed her to realize that I knew about them now, but I hadn't yet figured out how to broach the subject. As I remained silent, she sat there studying me. Eventually, she spoke again. I'm sorry, Ken. I came to apologize and to see if there's any shred of feeling left for me in your heart. 
I've learned my lesson, and I don't expect nor deserve another chance with you, but I'd seize it in an instant, if you offered. This was my opportunity. No, Naomi, that's not possible. I held on to those feelings for a while after our divorce, but recent revelations have erased them entirely. I've moved on, and there are a couple of friends I enjoy spending time with now. You might know one of them quite well. Surprise flickered across her face, questions forming in her eyes, but I didn't give her the chance to voice any of them. Anita Peterson is one hell of a woman. I always wondered what it'd be like with a petite blonde, and let me tell you, it's incredible. Turns out she's always wanted me too, especially since we had an open marriage and I had women in our bed while you were off with doctors in the on-call room. Naomi's face drained of all color as I continued speaking. You despicable, worthless woman. Not only did you betray our marriage by sleeping with other men, but you also deceived your colleagues to cover it up. And when the man you left me for cheated on you, you had the nerve to come back begging for forgiveness. Was that so you could resume your affairs while I remained oblivious? Well, I'm done with you, Naomi. Even if I never lay eyes on you again, it won't erase the pain you've caused. But it's a good start. I rose from my seat, tossed a $20 bill on the table, and left into the bright Omaha morning. The final act of revenge was complete. It was time to leave Naomi behind and embrace my new life. Now, regarding Shannon... That evening, we made love after she manipulated Jerry Van Doren into cheating, something shifted between us. As we lay together after our initial intimacy, I came to realize the depth of her affection for me, demonstrated by her willingness to sleep with another man solely for my benefit. I know, it sounds absurd. A man who wouldn't have stood a chance with her otherwise, given her high standards. And in that moment, I began to comprehend how much I loved her for making that sacrifice, just so I could exact revenge on my ex-wife. In that instant, Anita Peterson and any other potential friends with benefits faded from my mind. I was prepared to hold on to Shannon for as long as she would allow. However, I knew that for this to work, she would need to sever ties with her other FWBs, and I wasn't sure if she was willing to do so. I needed to address this with her urgently, as it could alter the course of our lives. Yet it turned out I didn't need to broach the subject at all. At that precise moment, she turned to me, kissed me, and declared, Ken, I'm ready to commit again. I've had my share of fun, just as you have with that blonde woman. We've both suffered from infidelity, so if you'll have me as your one and only, I promise to shield you from that pain ever again. She kissed me once more, and I smiled. Looking at her earnestly, I replied, are you certain you can do that? After all, you still need to file your taxes annually and there are countless accountants in this city eager to provide you with exceptional service. I hoped she understood I was joking. Her response reassured me that she did, saying, Don't worry about that, Ken. I haven't encountered anyone who knows how to fill out a long form like you do. She then rolled over onto me and straddled me. This marked the first time we made love as genuine partners, not just friends with benefits. Although it was our initial encounter, it certainly wouldn't be our last. Unexpectedly, there was another element to our revenge scheme. A couple of years after successfully executing our plan, Shannon and I were returning from a night of dancing, something we frequently enjoyed. On the way home, a drunk driver ran a red light and crashed it into our car on the driver's side. Although the airbags deployed and prevented serious injuries, I was shaken enough to require a trip to the hospital in an ambulance. Shannon remained with the car, reassured by the promise that the police would transport her to the ER once they were done with her. It didn't strike me as significant at first until I realized where they had brought me. As soon as the ambulance pulled into the emergency bay and the back door swung open, I spotted my ex-wife wearing nursing scrubs. It turned out I was going to be her patient for a while. The surprise on her face indicated that she still harbored feelings for me, though it was clearly one-sided. The paramedics briefed her on the specifics of my accident before departing. Once alone, she looked at me and, without even a greeting, inquired, Do I need to find another nurse to attend to you? Anita isn't on duty tonight, but we have other nurses available to care for you. I shook my head to decline. Naomi, I appreciate your skills as a nurse, 
and that's exactly what I need right now. Anita and I shared some good moments, but that's all they were. I have confidence that you'll take good care of me. Despite appearing relatively well, they decided to keep me under observation for a few hours to monitor my vitals. Naomi was present when Shannon entered. She hurried to the bed, planted a quick kiss on me, then glanced around the room, realizing we weren't alone. Shannon, this is Naomi, my nurse and ex-wife. Naomi, meet my girlfriend Shannon. They exchanged handshakes and Naomi said, Nice to meet you, Shannon. Shannon smiled and responded, Likewise, please take good care of Ken for me. Shannon subtly staked her claim on me there and I didn't mind one bit. However, I noticed Naomi's puzzled expression when she shook Shannon's hand. It persisted until it seemed to overwhelm her. She looked at Shannon again and asked, You seem familiar? Have we met before? I held my breath as Shannon responded, I doubt it. I was in an indie film shot here in Omaha a couple of years back, but I don't think it got a wide release. Maybe you caught wind of that. Naomi shook her head. No, I don't recall anything like that. She exited the room, heading toward the nurse's station. Finally, I could exhale, glancing up at Shannon, who wore a mischievous grin. She chuckled as she leaned in to kiss me, saying, Maybe I should have asked if she wanted to watch a copy. God, I adore that woman.